Hi everyone, I'm Brian Strauser, Principal and Chief Executive here at BrightPath, and I'd like to welcome you to this presentation on simplifying your business continuity program. I originally presented this presentation at the Secure360 2024 conference here in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul. For those of you that I've not met, my name is Brian Strauser. I founded BrightPath 10 years ago after a two-decade career at a Fortune 30 corporation where I built and led their business continuity crisis management and global intelligence program. Here at Bright Path, we work with the world's leading brands to help them strategically navigate uncertainty and disruption. And I'm excited to talk with you today about how you can ensure the success of your business continuity program and gain more credibility in your organization by simplifying your program. So what is the challenge that I think is out there as a consultant in this space? And that challenge, I believe, is that most resilience programs are just too damn complicated. Uh, they often look something like this when you try to explain them to a business stakeholder. And who blames them for not understanding what's going on? We speak in our own language. We use a jargon. BIA, BCP, DRP, DR, steer co, test, exercise, and we often don't explain what these things are. We use inconsistent language when we're describing business continuity, disaster recovery, incident management, and crisis management. And we have some complex processes that we don't always do a good job of explaining. Business impact analysis, or BIA, business continuity planning, or BCP, training and exercises. We make all of this too complicated. And that complexity drives a challenge for us because folks don't want to buy in to the things that we're doing. We struggle to explain what we're doing in simple, straightforward terms, the elevator speech, uh, so to speak. So an actual question that I asked someone just a few weeks ago in a conversation, a resilience program leader for a corporation, I said, tell me Pretend that I am the new head of IT infrastructure here at your company. Can you briefly explain your disaster recovery program to me? And this is what I got. Complexity. In fact, I didn't even understand the answer after I heard the answer. It didn't get us anywhere in the conversation. You've heard the phrase elevator speech. That's part of what we're talking about here is how can we explain this in a relatively simple, straightforward way to someone who is not a subject matter expert in business continuity or resilience. One Fortune 50 CEO told me in an interview, and you may have heard me tell this story before, why do I have to do this shit? Like, why is this even important? Because no one had ever explained it to him in a way that made sense from a business perspective. So let me give you a practical example of this by starting with the business impact analysis or the BIA. In my mind, in my team's mind, the BIA is the single biggest culprit in program complexity that we see here at BrightPath. If you read the definition of a business impact analysis from the ISO 22301 standard, that's what I'm showing here, an organization shall use the process for analyzing business impacts to determine business continuity priorities and requirements. This process shall define the impact types and criteria relevant to the context of the organization. Identify the activities that support the provision of products and services. Use the impact types and criteria for assessing the impacts over time resulting from disruption of those activities. Identify the time frame in which the impact of not resuming these activities becomes unacceptable to the organization. That might be the recovery time objective. Uh, the standard refers to maximum tolerable period of disruption. RTO is probably more well understood. Set prioritized time frames within the time identified for resuming those activities at a minimum acceptable capacity. Use that analysis to identify those prioritized activities, determine what resources are needed to support them, and then determine the dependencies, including partners and suppliers and interdependencies of prioritized activities. Okay, that sounds like a lot. There is a lot of things here, but you can simplify this down. But here's where we go wrong. We go wrong by starting to ask the wrong audience for some of this information. For example, one of the organizations that we've interacted with over the last couple of years asked in their BIA, which was a multi-tab, hundreds of field prop fields required process in Excel, not a BC tool. They asked, 
you know, what are the technology dependencies that you have? Which is a business team is a reasonable question to ask. If I'm the head of payroll uh, and you ask me what applications my team uses, I should be able to answer that question or someone from my team should be able to answer that question. What I don't know is where that's hosted or who hosts it. I have no idea. You need to go to IT for that information. And ideally, you're pulling that in through some sort of data feed from your source of truth, your CMDB or something else. So asking the wrong audience for information leads you astray and it frustrates your business teams. The second is just asking for unnecessary information. You don't need all whole bunch of extraneous stuff. It's enough of a challenge to get through the BIA getting the required information down. We w helped a company a few years ago with a BIA where they literally had 168 fields in a BIA. And most of them were never used for anything. So why collect it? Why ask for it? Why put your business teams through that? Another challenge is conducting the BIA too low in the organization. And what I mean by that is you need to identify your critical processes, but you don't need to identify that those processes are made up of five steps and all five of those steps should have a separate BIA. You need to conduct the BIA at the right level of process within the organization. So that might require you to kind of feel your way around with this a little bit, but if you do it too low in the org, you're going to get too detailed of a process and you're gonna have hundreds or thousands of BIAs when you only need 100, 150 or so of those. Again, your mileage may vary. So one example of this for one of our organization, one of our clients uh, in prior years uh, in their claims function, they had 21 BIAs that covered every single step of the process, even if it was performed within a few minutes by the same team using the same people and the same technology systems. And it would take that business team 45 to 50 hours to complete the BIA, about two hours per BIA. After we helped them simplify this, this was two BIAs. It covered the major handoff between the internal team and the third party that was responsible for managing the claim with the insurers and the payers within a healthcare revenue cycle. They did the BIA in two to three hours in the first year and then 30 to 60 minutes for the necessary annual update. Huge savings in time for this business team. Literally went from a week or more of labor of total man hours, total person hours, to a two or three hour BIA and then a few minutes of a BIA, less than an hour of a BIA in the following years. We didn't lose any, uh, we didn't lose uh, an understanding of the process in this, in this because we kept it at the right level in the organization. So simplifying helped the team gain credibility and get more buy-in for the program. Another challenge with the BIA is having some kind of black box calculation uh, to determine the RTO. And what I mean by that is that the business team puts in inputs and then it coughs up a recovery time for that business process with no understanding of the methodology and a difficult process to override that. Don't do that. Make your, if you're gonna use a weighted formula to come up with the BIA, or come up with your RTOs rather, make it clear that that's what you're doing and then share that openly with the team and give them a way to bypass it if they have a strong business case as to why their, their RTO should be something else. If you refuse to do those things, those things, all you will do is aggravate the business team and you're not gonna get the buy-in that you're looking for. The next is capturing the impact of a disruption and capturing this in a way in the BIA that makes sense for a business team. Don't overcomplicate this. We saw a BIA recently that had 25 different time factors in 10 areas of impact that required a business team to have to think about 250 different impact points. And then in doing so, they had to make an assessment using a pretty fuzzy set of criteria. Most business teams really, really struggle with this. And even today, I had a conversation with a client where we're helping them with their BIA. They're going from paper to a BC tool and they were capturing financial impacts over time. And we had a really good conversation about simplifying this. Um, instead of capturing all of these different time points, what do you really need to know? to inform your point of view? And is there a different way to get to the cost and revenue impact over time that you think that you might need? So when you're capturing impact, I would encourage you to think about what is a simple way to do this. Financial revenue expense is important. 
compliance and regulatory operations, reputational impact, and maybe team impact are all things you want to measure. I would measure the level of impact using some criteria that you define, high, medium, low, critical, whatever works for you. Uh, and then at what point does that impact happen? Is it immediately? Is it an hour, five hours, a day, two days, three days, a week? Keep Try to minimize the number of options as much as you can to fit your specific business needs, but don't overcomplicate this. Don't be afraid with your BIA and with your plans, to be fair, to um, iterate things over time. Be comfortable developing a minimum viable product. Uh, roll that out in a way that lets you get through your life cycle in the first year. And then think about how you can add more factors to this and make it more complicated over time. And then make sure you're explaining the value that you're gaining, uh, that business teams are gaining by completing the BIA. One way that we've explained this and had good success in understanding it is explaining to teams that we're trying to accomplish something from a BIA perspective. And what we're trying to accomplish is when something happens that we can answer some questions in order to gauge impact and effectively respond and recover from that disruption. So for example, in a company that has a product team, I'm on, focused on uh, item one here, if I sell products or I serve some kind of electronic product perhaps, I wanna understand when that product is disrupted, well, what customers are impacted and what is the impact? I wanna understand impacted critical processes connected to that product. I wanna understand the impact from a BI perspective on the company from that disruption. And I wanna understand what teams should be involved, what teams should be at the table. If I use change healthcare as an example, and think about that as a third party disruption, so bucket six here. Well, in a vendor disruption, I wanna understand the impact that has on our processes, our products, our sites, our technologies. I wanna know who is the business owner of that relationship. I wanna understand the impact on the company from that disruption, which I get from the BIAs, and I wanna know what teams need to be involved. When you start to explain the BIA like this, it's pretty easy for business leaders to start to grasp the value of an effective business impact analysis as a part of your planning process. Now let's shift and talk a little bit about business continuity plans. We had a, a company we helped with an after action on a data breach in 2023 uh, recently, and we were meeting with their chief HR officer, and they had business continuity plans in place. And we asked, in this disruption where you had no access to any systems, how did you use your business continuity plans? And they said, no, we didn't. We didn't use our BC plans because they're completely unusable. They were unusable because they were pages and pages and pages of boilerplate material that the team simply couldn't comprehend or understand how to use or that helped them in this kind of a disruption. It contained duplicative information that was best stored elsewhere. So you had multiple sources of truth instead of one. Um, it contained governance information in the plan that should really be uh, in a policy or in a steering committee document. It had confusing roles and responsibilities on who was doing what. It created separate business continuity teams uh, when plans needed to be used instead of just mirroring the org structure uh, within HR in this case. So it had like a business recovery and resumption team and people had weird titles and things that business leaders just, it didn't resonate with them. They didn't understand it. It was complicated. It didn't help them. And that's why they didn't use it. It contained unclear operational procedures and you kind of get the idea. Your business continuity plan should be relatively straightforward. It should contain the scope, the purpose, the assumptions that are baked in the plan. What does this plan cover? What is the purpose of this plan? In this plan, what are the assumptions we are making? What's a summary of the critical processes covered by this plan, the BIA summary? How do we activate the plan? How do we notify people within the plan? How do we deactivate the plan when the disruption is over? And then what are our recovery procedures? What are our workarounds and recovery strategies we're gonna use? And then a change log to track changes. When we talk about recovery strategies and procedures, Again, we go to the ISO standard for guidance. The ISO standard 2301 says, recovery procedures should be specific regarding the immediate steps that are to be taken 
be flexible to respond to the changing conditions of the disruption, focus on the impact of incidents that could lead to a disruption, be effective in minimizing that impact through the implementation of appropriate solutions and assigning roles and responsibilities for tasks within them. Don't overcomplicate it. This is what you're after in your BC plan. We believe that business continuity plans must be supported by a response structure, some kind of crisis management process or incident management process that that plan's activation sits within. BC plans are really not standalone things. We want them to be used within a response structure, and that response structure should be documented somewhere else, not as a part of the BC plan. You might reference it, but it's not part of the plan. Then we think about just, you get through BIAs, you get through simplifying your BC plans, then it's how do you explain things in a simple way? What is that elevator speech that you wanna use? I always had a walk around story deck. The story deck was, how do I explain what my team does, what our program does, to anyone who will listen to me talk about this. In back in the paper organizer days, I literally carried this two to four page deck in a tab in my planner. And anytime anybody asked me, I could just flip to it and I could take them through the story. Today, I would keep something like this on an iPad. And if somebody asked me, I would whip out the iPad and I would walk through my story. You should have a story deck for your team and your program. You can start with something like this. Uh, this is a, form I've, a format I've used a number of times. What is the mission of your team, of your program? What do you do? Well, the continuity life cycle, we manage the continuity program, and then we have some consulting. We support partners, we support compliance, we support new strategic initiatives. initiatives. Foundational things, we support the crisis management team, but we are responsible for leading continuity, incident, response, and recovery within that crisis management framework or emergency management framework, if that's the term that you use. Now, the second part of this walk around deck is to talk about program structure. And I use this to explain the makeup of the business continuity or the resilience program. Um, I lay out at the top that this is about building resilience in the organization and mitigating risk through a matrix team approach. And here I've just outlined that the program is made up of the business continuity team, which focuses on business continuity plans, training, exercises, and recovery following an incident or a crisis. The IT team focuses on the availability of technology systems and disaster recovery, planning, texting, testing, and recovery following an incident or crisis. Whatever the makeup of your organization and your program is, this is an important slide to lay out that there's different elements to the program and where the roles and responsibilities sit around that. From there, I usually explain uh, in a third slide, uh, part of the story, that there's some type of annual life cycle to business continuity. That that life cycle is a cyclical process of assessing threats and impacts, developing, exercising, and maintaining plans. And I use the simple, this is our version of this, but you would have your own, that kind of lays out assess, that's the BIA, plan, the BC planning process, practicing through exercises, and then maturing, kind of continual plan updates, uh, continual plan maintenance and adopting those lessons learned that come out of that life cycle. Sometimes in some audiences, I'll use a more complicated explanation of this. Um, this one goes into all of the elements of um, understanding risk and how risk comes into your BIA, how that moves into BC and DR planning, how we capture issues coming out of exercises and testing. And then on the bottom here, um, how an incident becomes a crisis, how that leads to plan activation, and then after action process and capturing lessons learned. This is more complex. This could be really overwhelming to some folks, but in some audiences, it's important to understand what that process looks like. So let's kind of bring all of this to a head. Um, first, uh, get out your red pen, get out your editing pen, and get ready to take a look at your BIAs and your plans and your awareness documentation and start to edit this down to what is truly important. Take out the jargon. Where you see jargon, replace it with plain language. Where you see acronyms, replace it with plain language. Look to find ways to level set definitions in your company. I, I get asked a lot uh, about 
do you call it business continuity? Do you call it resilience? What do you call disaster recovery? Is a BC plan part of a DR plan? Is a DR plan part of a crisis plan? Look, I don't care. Settle on some, settle on some definitions that you are in comfortable that you are comfortable with for your organization, and then stick with that, and be consistent with it. I would take time to survey your stakeholders and ask about their time investment and perceived value here in this process. Um, what they're taking away from this, what their perception of your team uh, and your program would be. If we were doing this in person, I would pause here for Q and A, uh, but we're not. Uh, so I'm here to wrap things up. But if you have questions, feel free to put those in the comments uh, and we'll make sure that we come back and answer those in time. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I hope you got some value out of this presentation. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel for other webinars and presentations for shorts. And of course, our weekly award-winning podcast, The Managing Uncertainty Podcast, which comes out every Monday morning at 6.30 Central Time. That's it. I hope to see you down the road. Be well. Thanks for watching our video. To learn more about how to manage uncertainty and disruption in your organization, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to our video channel. And here are a few more videos that we've selected that will help you learn more about business continuity, crisis management, and crisis communications.